As Christians, we believe the gospel. And the word gospel simply refers to the good news of what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection accomplished. Earlier in our time of confession, we read from the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28 that talks about this commission to go out and preach the gospel. And we heard from the Apostle Paul there in Romans 10 as he talked about the, the blessedness of those who bring and preach the good news. And one of the reasons that that gospel is good news is it has an effect not only on eternity, which is what we tend to think about, and that's right and true, but it also has an effect in the here and now. The gospel creates a new reality that we can experience in human relationships. It transforms us. And so it's often good for us as Christians to ask, what is now possible in my life that was not possible before I believed the gospel. We ask that question because we understand that the gospel is going to create new possibilities. I am now, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and His gospel, it is possible for me to do things now that was not possible for me to do before I was a Christian. And in this particular sermon to the congregation, as Christians have titled this here in Matthew 18, Jesus addresses a number of things that apart from believing in Christ, this radical life would not be possible. But now, because of the gospel, we are able, it is possible for us to live this radical life of confrontation. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, we see this practical instruction on how we are to live together as a community of Christians. The gospel makes something that would be otherwise unimaginable, not just possible, but makes it a means of bringing healing grace into our church as we live and interact with each other. Jesus is telling here in this passage that we've read for this morning, He is telling His followers then and He is telling His followers today how to act when a brother or sister in Christ sins against someone else in the congregation. In this situation where someone has sinned against another Christian, the gospel makes a radically new, radically attractive thing possible. Now, when you read these words here in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15, particularly through verse 18, 17, you might question, Seth, why do you use the word attractive? This, this isn't attractive, right? Matter of fact, most churches, they, they'll never come close to this particular passage because it's offensive in the eyes of many people. It's deemed as harsh, something we want to avoid. But the reason people think that way is because they are not thinking rightly about what these words mean and the implication they have on Christian community. Now clearly, apart from the transforming effects of the gospel, what is described here in Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 through 17, these things we recognize could get very ugly very fast. The process could and no doubt would get derailed almost immediately if the gospel is not in play. And so it's not surprising to us that those who are outside the church that do not believe the gospel, they are anti-gospel, we we're not surprised that they see this and say, oh, that's wrong, that's not right, because they don't have the gospel. And it's not surprising that even within the church there are those who are hesitant to embrace this truth because they themselves are not living in a full understanding of the implications of the gospel. They are probably just thinking of the gospel as a benefit to get you into heaven, which it is, but it has much more. We can imagine, or perhaps you have been a part of this, where self-righteousness and how pride and hunger for power and bitterness would derail this process before it even began. But instead of a situation that is doomed to degenerate into hurt and anger and divisiveness, this situation of someone sinning against someone else 
can actually become an experience of healing grace, of restoration. And the reason that is possible is because of the transforming power of the gospel. If we can't deal with sinning against each other in grace, then what power do we really have in comparison to those outside the church? The gospel makes this possible because the gospel introduces new ingredients into this situation, like love, like humility, like forgiveness. And it's all because of the effect of this work and the presence of Christ that this process is possible among God's people. We see the foundation of these steps. What we're going to do is look at what sort of is the foundation of this process of confrontation. What makes it possible? We said the gospel, but we're going to look into it in a little more detail of why the gospel is able to do that. And then what I want to do is work through these three steps that are presented by Jesus on how we ought to confront someone when they have sinned against us. The foundation is there in verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, and again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So Jesus is saying, look, when this is asked in my name, that is, in keeping with my reign, you're asking something in allegiance with what I want to see done. Right? We, if we ask something of Jesus that's contrary to the Bible, but we slap on, well, we're asking it in Jesus' name, that's actually contrary to asking in Jesus' name. Right? Historically, we have the practice of end of prayer, and we say, I ask this in Jesus' name. Where that's coming from, partly, is here. But when Jesus says, ask it in my name, he's not saying, tack my name on to the end of it. He's saying, ask it according to my, the intent of my purposes and my kingdom. So when you ask something that's sort of agreeing with what, that Jesus could be there and say, yes, that's what I would want done in this situation. He's saying, when you ask in that way, my presence is going to be with you in carrying that out. I'm going to be in your midst. So when we carry out these tasks as pliant people, as modest people, as unhurting people, that's the intention. We're going after these people with the right attitude, in keeping with how Jesus would do it. Jesus is saying, I'm going to be present in your midst when you ask something that would agree with what I would want done in that situation. So this process... Jesus says that I'm instructing you to engage in is not some merely human process. Jesus is saying, when you go about it, it's something I've asked you to do. And when you ask for my help in this, I'm going to promise that my presence will be with you as you live out this radical life of confrontation. So in the challenges of this situation of confronting someone, Jesus says, I will be present I will be active bringing healing and bringing help to that situation, to those conversations. And as a result of Christ's presence, this process can be radically different. It can be grace-giving. It can be church-strengthening. It can be joy-bringing. It can glorify our God as the attractive work that God intends it to be. So by this promise, telling the disciples, if you agree on this, on earth, I will be among you, Jesus is investing an authority and a confidence into the church for this practice. Very similar to what we read earlier in the service in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, I have all authority and I'm commissioning you to go out to teach people about me, to baptize them in my name, and teaching them to obey all things that I have taught you, which of course would include what we're reading here this morning. And so just as Jesus is saying in that moment, I have authority and because I have that authority, you can be sent out as my disciples to spread my gospel. Here he's saying the same thing. I have authority when you carry out this process with my intention, my authority, my presence is a seal of approval on your task. So by his power and by his presence, Jesus wants us to carry out this task 
with a confidence because He is with us. And with a confidence that He will be working through us as we follow His instruction. So that, that's sort of the foundation of this confrontation. We do it because Jesus has promised to be with us when we carry it out in His name. That is according to His agenda and not our own. Now, upon this foundation, Jesus lays out how we are to act when a fellow Christian is in spiritual danger. When they are wandering from the truth, when they have personally sinned against someone, there, there's a lot of ways that that sin can come into play. They're believing something that's wrong, or they're living in a way sort of committedly that is, that is contrary to the truth, creating a spiritual danger for themselves and also for the church. So let's look at these three steps together. The first step there is in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Pretty simple. Very simple in the sense that if he actually listens, then there is nothing else that needs to be done after that point. And what I want to do is break this this verse down and looking at certain key words, and I think will help us understand what Jesus is saying and answer questions you might have about this passage. The first word I want to draw your attention to is the very first word there. If your brother sins against you. And this if, beginning the sentence, is a, means it is a conditional sentence. It describes something, uh, well, a general condition, in the sense that it describes something that will be a common practice. Jesus isn't saying here, if on the very rare occasion a fellow Christian were to sin against you. That's not his intention. Jesus knows that, that these disciples are going to sin against each other. He's just had to talk them off an argument about who's going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Right? They're jockeying for position. James and John get their own mother later on to ask Jesus, hey, will you let my boy sit at your right hand in your kingdom? He knows these people aren't going to get along perfectly. And so he understands this is going to happen. If your brother does that, if your brother sins, when he daily does that, he's going to do it a lot, Jesus is implying, your brother and sisters in Christ will sin against you. And this is a point that needs to be made because so many Christians get blindsided by this. They're like, I've been hurt at the church. Well, of course you have. Well, who do you think gathers there? Sinners. You know what a sinner does? They sin against people. And guess what? You've hurt people in the church as well. Because you are a sinner. So the question is, and we shouldn't be shocked by that, the problems come because we don't deal with that sin against one another according to Christ's wisdom. We think we're wiser than God. And, and, and I saw that when I was studying this passage and reading the numerous commentaries of how so many commentators were trying to say we don't actually have to do what Jesus says to do here. So our brothers and sisters are going to sin. And when it happens, Jesus gives us the way we should respond. He, he doesn't say we shouldn't, with, we shouldn't withdraw in a huff from that person. We shouldn't shut down that relationship. We shouldn't just try to escape from the setting or leave the church. Right? There are a number of people, and we, this is one of the reasons we do membership interviews. When people are trying to join our church, we're trying to find out if, if they've left in a huff or if they've reconciled before they leave another church. Because a lot of people spend their entire life not dealing with conflict biblically, and churches allow them just to move from church to church with never confronting them about that very unhelpful, sinful way of dealing with conflict. We can't allow that. Because it's not good for people or the witness of the church. So, the way in which we should respond when our brothers and sisters sin against us, Jesus says here, and it's only possible... Because of the gospel. Notice the second word that I want to draw your attention to is the word brother. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. So this isn't talking about when a non-Christian sins against you. And this is why I found that as, as Christians a lot of times we're far more comfortable confronting the sin of unbelievers. Right? These preachers get on TV and wail against the sin of America, and I'm like, brother, let's go to your church. 
Let's start dealing with some of the issues in your own congregation that you're ignoring. You ignore that because those people pay your, your salary. Right? And instead, Jesus never tells us to go out and try to find that, that we have the responsibility to command and correct the behavior of unbelieving individuals in the world. These people are doing wrong, Seth. Well, of course they are. They're not Christians. Why would you expect them to live as a follower of Christ? But if you claim to be a Christian and you belong to this church, we do expect you to do what Jesus says because you claim to be a follower of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 is a verse that I wish more people were familiar with. And Paul has to deal with a situation like this where there's a man in the church that's committed some sin. And he says there, I'm going to read starting in verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, who says, I'm a Christian. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Now here's the key verse, verse 12. For what, Paul says, have I to do with judging outsiders? What do I have to do with that? His point is nothing. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Right? So Jesus, they're there, Jesus through the Apostle Paul is giving instruction to say, look, Paul's saying, I'm not, I'm not going about judging the wickedness going on in the city of Corinth. Of course it's going on. God's going to deal with that. But when we talk about within the church, those who claim an allegiance to Christ, we have a responsibility to make a call on whether that's right or wrong and to deal with it. So, when it says that we are to deal with sin, a life of confrontation, that is not dealing with unchristian people. We ought to talk about sin with them, but in the context of the gospel. Not in trying to perform some kind of behavior modification on unbelieving people. Instead, the idea here of brother is someone who is, you are sharing community with. I would even say that we shouldn't really be focused on dealing with the sin of some brother on the other side of the world. We can't be this, have this type of relationship with every Christian that lives on the world. We have to be more narrowed and focused, and I believe that is to be focused on those that we interact with the most. And primarily, that's going to be in a local church. And so when he talks about confronting a brother or sister, he's indicating this has the, the care of a family member. It's about a personal, loving care for someone with whom we bear a close relationship with Christ. Those who follow him, Jesus says, are his brothers and sisters. And so we are brothers and sisters to one another. That's where that language comes from. And so the focus is on family and not on sort of some self-interest or some judgmental denunciation of people. That's not what Jesus is out. It's not a, it shouldn't have a judicial tone to it. It has more care, more pastoral. Because care is the ultimate goal of this process, not a punitive approach, which is how it's often characterized. And sadly, in the history of the church, that's the way it has been used sometimes. So we've looked at this idea of if. We recognize it's going to happen. We recognize that this confrontation is not with unbelievers or even Christians on social media or somebody that we really don't know. It's someone that we, we're involved with this person. They've made a particular commitment in a local church. And then he uses the word sin. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. And that's what ought to be the key of the conversation. It's not that he hurt your feelings. It's not that she has some annoying behavior. It's not that they don't conform to your etiquette, right? If you think that this is a pal person ought to say yes ma'am or no ma'am and they don't do that. Well, that's not from the Bible. That's just some etiquette that your culture's brought up. That's not, that doesn't have the authority of God said do it. We confront people over things that the Bible says are sin, not the other things that happen. The issue has to be a clear violation of Scripture. 
Notice here as well, what are we to do? If your brother sins against you, go. Now, if you do a deep Greek study on that, you know what that word go means. It means go, right? A lot of these, it's, it's true, it's that simple. When we are sinned against, there are a number of ways we can respond. We can sit and sulk. We can tell someone else so they can go to the person and sort of indicate something's wrong. We can act cold towards the person and withdraw until they guess that we've been offended and they'll come to us. But none of those are suggested by the Lord Jesus here. He gives a very short, brief word. You go. Go. And Jesus knows that there are things that might prevent you from going. Fear of how it will turn out, the hurt that you've experienced, the anger that you're still working through. And so, because he knows that there are these obstacles, his word to us is oh so clear. Go. Go to the person. Take responsibility. Set up a conversation. Write a letter. However it is you're going to communicate, start that process. And what do you do when you go? If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. You confront. That, the Greek word here is a little more complicated. The idea of bringing something into light is really what Jesus is trying to say. That the, the gospel, when we do that, when we tell someone their fault, this is where the gospel needs to be fully operating. We need to go with an awareness of our own capacity to sin. Right? We're, we're not better than this person. We need to go with without sort of hastingly to condemn the person. That's not our intention. We're not going to somehow score some moral victory points over this person. Because if it's hard to receive a rebuke, which it is, it requires humility to do so. If it's hard to receive a rebuke, I actually think it's harder to give one with genuine humility, to do, give a rebuke rightly. But we must do it. Because here, Jesus is clearly saying, the issue must be raised. It can't be danced around. We can't beat around the bush. We can't hold, well, you know, we'll let the Holy Spirit do that. Those are all excuses that we come up with to avoid doing what Jesus clearly commands us to do. And I think because of that, it hurts the strength of the church. We don't just let it sit hoping the issue will go away. Now, sometimes it will, right? The Bible does say in another place that, that love covers a multitude of sin. And so we can't confront someone every time sin happens because there's just simply too much sin. All we would be doing is confronting one another, right? So we can't be overly sensitive in this as well. But if it gets to a point where someone sinned against you and you literally cannot stop thinking about it, you must go to the person and deal with it. We know, as Jesus does, that this confrontation will test a relationship. It's not easy to hear rebuke, and it's not easy to deliver one in a gentle way. But when the gospel is held among the people, and when the gospel is operating in people's lives on both sides of the conversation, the gospel completely transforms this encounter. And it will become a means of pouring out grace into the lives of those people. It is the person who doesn't really understand the implications of the gospel who says, what right do you have to go to another? That idea carries with it that we're going to another to score moral victory points over people. We don't have a right to approach it that way. But how do we not love someone... We see them in a sin that's entrapped in them, that's going to cause them great pain, that's going to harm the church, harm the witness of the church, and we don't do anything about that. That's not loving. That's staying with the 99 and saying, well, one wandered. We're not going to pursue that person. That's not the spirit of Christ. No matter how many people want to try to twist the scripture to say it's unloving, Jesus told us to do it. So we must. It is the person who doesn't understand the implication of the gospel who dismisses a concern for another person's spiritual well-being 
as being bad form or as self-righteous meddling. And again, we have to fully acknowledge this process can get into that. And we want to avoid that. But just because something can be wrong doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue it. We just have to pursue it rightly. And so Jesus says to us, understanding the gospel implication, it's made us pliant, it's made us humble, it's made us where we don't want to have anything in our life that hurts or causes another person to stumble. It's created within us a desire to pursue other people. And now as we pursue them, Jesus says we have to go. This is the process. Go to your brother and sister and tell them their fault. Raise the issue of their sin. The sixth word I want to draw your attention to in verse 15 is your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Alone. The whole process is carried out with a minimum of publicity. Again, the, call, the goal is not to shame this person. The goal isn't try to run their, their name through the mud or, get, or uh, sort of have this I gotcha moment. That's not the purpose. It's not the intention. Minimum exposure is the operation protocol. And Jesus wants to avoid other people having to be brought into the situation. Now, when someone has been abused, whether that's physical abuse or sexual abuse, in those situations, I would not encourage, nor do I think Jesus intends for you to confront that person in person by yourself. Right? We have to use some more wisdom from the Scripture on that. But in those situations, you could pin a letter to that person confronting them or an email, some form of written communication that doesn't put you in a dangerous situation. And the same can be true when we're confronting people in authority. It can be helpful for us not to go in person because there can be a power dynamic that's, that's not healthy in that situation. And so it can be helpful to, to have a letter sent to that person or an email or some form of that nature because we, want, we don't want to put someone in a dangerous situation like that. But still, there's a way to, to keep the alone nature without there having to be a personal conversation, though I think that is, most of the time, the best way to do that. It's more personal. And the last word I want to draw your attention to here, step number one, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And then he goes on to say, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. You've gained. And in that word, Jesus gives us the purpose, the goal of what we're after in this process. The purpose is not to win some personal battle. It's not to be punitive. It's not to punish someone. It's not to shame them. It's not to make them feel bad. All of those things, God forbid us approaching it that way. The assumption here is that there is going to be forgiveness. That's why Matthew puts this parable of the unforgiving servant right after this process. Notice there in verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. So the indication is, the goal is that this person is, that's being confronted is going to ask forgiveness. And then Jesus, knowing our tendency to not want to forgive, says, let me tell you a little story to remind you why you ought to forgive that person once you've confronted them about their fault. He knows us. So the purpose there is restoration, that there's a confrontation, there's a repentance, there's a listening to it, and then as a result, there's forgiveness, so a relationship is restored. You've gained your brother back. So the goal is our brother or sister in Christ being rescued, not trying to prove him wrong and prove ourselves right, but we go out of love. Because we don't want our brother or sister in any way hindered in their relationship with Christ or his church. Because we know from the scripture that unattended sin bears terrible fruit. Marriages end because sin is left alone. It's not confronted. When the first sin is not addressed in any of our lives, the result will be more and more deeper sin if we're not brought to repentance. So the purpose is to help our fellow Christian. And again, this is a fearful task. If, if you are sort of are skipping into the process, there's probably a time where you need to check your heart. There ought to be a bit of trembling and a fear with this. But the antidote to our fear is a love for our siblings. To think of ourselves in their shoes, that we would want someone in kindness to leave the 99 and to pursue us. Because that's what we would want God to do. 
Now, the reality is, Jesus alludes to this in this passage, in this confrontation, they might refuse to listen. But the gospel makes something possible, and therefore Christians have every reason to engage with this process with hope. The gospel brings ingredients that are necessary for success to take place, for repentance and restoration. It brings gentleness. This comes from knowing that we ourselves are sinners and in need of forgiveness. The gospel brings humility. For we recognize that we ourselves have been forgiven much. It brings forgiveness. Because we have had the experience of being forgiven much by God, we are able to forgive those who have committed a fault against us. So all of these fruits of the gospel, gentleness, humility, love, forgiveness, they are available. And Christ says, if you approach this task as I've instructed, with the demeanor that marks my demeanor, my tone towards this person, he says, I will be among you in doing that. So as a result of those promises, we have every reason to go, and we have every reason to be open to someone coming to us with loving correction. And these occasions where this has happened and where I have seen this and been a part of this, this giving and receiving can be some of the sweetest moments of a church's life. Because in the midst of those situations, Christ is present, pouring out His grace. Now, step number two and three are going to be far much briefer, because most of the time, it ends there. Thanks be to God, right? His gospel works and brings about reconciliation. However, in verse 16, Jesus is aware that that person might not listen. And he says there in verse 16, But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He may resist. She may refuse to listen. And if that's not... If that's the result, it's not now we turn from the gospel to the law, right? That's not his intention, even though here Jesus does quote from Deuteronomy. It's still the gospel that we're hoping to change people's lives. They may not listen, but the gospel within our community will determine and pursue that person with the same tone, with the same humility, the same love, the same concern to restore. None of that changes. Really, the only thing that changes is that these witnesses are brought into it. And we hear the word witness, right? And if you're like me, it brings me back to watching Matlock with my grandparents, right? And we can think about some courtroom scene. And that's, that's not the image Jesus wants to give us there. That's, that's us bringing Matlock back into Matthew 18. These are witnesses not to the original sin, okay? Rather, these witnesses are there who are going to bear witness to the fact that this conversation is, is being had. They're there to, to later on, if they don't listen here, and the matter's brought before the church, it isn't just this person's word versus that person's word. There's been witnesses who didn't see what happened, but they observed the conversation, and they're making a ruling on what's taking place. They're there to strengthen the appeal to this sister, and they serve as a mature, discerning, godly presence in that conversation. Yes, it heightens and strengthens the appeal, but also it provides perspective to the conversation and hopefully minimize the danger of some unjust accusation that's brought against the person. You might think this person sinned against you. You go talk to them. They don't listen. They say, oh, you're making a big deal out of nothing. And that can happen. And then so two witnesses are needed to be brought in so that the conversation begin had and the witness go, yeah, that is a legitimate situation. Or no, you are making a bigger deal out of that. That's not a sin that this person is committed to you. So that's the wisdom of bringing those witnesses in. They're helping, hopefully, deal with the problem at that step. Now again, Jesus indicates here that the person may continue to resist. But even at this step, the gospel can make something else possible. The gospel operating in the words and the demeanor of these two or three witnesses makes something else possible. And the persistence of this gospel focus is powerful. We can't undermine that. Remember, this isn't just a human process. Jesus is present in the midst of it. But still, even with that gospel influence, the person may still refuse to listen. Notice there in verse 17, if they refuse to listen, we must strengthen the appeal. 
If he refuses to listen to them, that is to the witnesses, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. So let's focus there on step three. That is presumably when this step is brought before the church. And the idea is that in some gathered setting of the church, the issue is raised. And again, even here, the purpose is not to pronounce judgment, but to strengthen the appeal to this fellow Christian to turn from this committed pattern of sin. You've got to realize at this point, they've been pr- confronted privately. They've had two or three other mature Christians sit down with them with the Scripture and show them, look, this is where you're out of line. And now, at, only after they refuse them to that point are they brought before the church so that the church now can appeal to them to do what the Scripture says. The appeal as well is one of care. And it's communicated by the church. Don't stay where you're at. That's not where you belong. You belong with us. Return to us. Come back to the fold and stop wandering. And if this is carried out with the same gospel tone and demeanor that we've talked about in the earlier steps, it is possible that even at this step, a person may be gained. But at this point, they could still refuse. But at the gospel makes another step possible. Each step here is given to give room for the gospel to work and to unleash its power. It shouldn't be a rushed process. But with great sobriety, Jesus says there at the end of verse 17, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Paul used the language, let this evil person be purged from your midst. So, some people read these words and remember that Jesus ate with Gentiles and tax collectors. But what you have to realize is that those were Gentiles and tax collectors who had never become part of the church. So when Jesus says, treat them as a Gentile and tax collector, what he's saying is they should be viewed not as a brother and sister in Christ. They should be viewed as someone who needs to be evangelized, because that's how you would treat a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, there's a little bit more to that in the sense if the person continues to claim to be a Christian, then our fellowship with them cannot be like it could be with someone who's immoral of the world. We saw that from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 I read earlier. What Jesus is saying here is given this person's persistent prideful, stubborn refusal to acknowledge their sin, this person has already placed themselves outside the circle of God's blessing. And now as a visible sign that they themselves have done that, the community of believers of which this person is, was belonging, that person is to be set apart. They are, we are to suspend normal fellowship with that person. That is, we shouldn't spend time, we shouldn't go out and play golf with them and act like nothing's wrong. That's not the case. This person is confused, deceived greatly in thinking that they are right with God and yet they can continue in this worldly pattern and if we come along and act like nothing's wrong with that, it just continues to let them feel comfortable in their deceit. Whereas someone who's not a professing Christian and is living that way, they're not living under the sort of this delusion that they're right with God. They don't either believe God exists or they reject what we would teach about God as Christians. This person who has refused to listen to three different occasions, just think of the arrogance of that. One person confronts you with the Scripture, then two other people that are respectable Christians confront you, then the entire church says, yeah, we're all in agreement, you're wrong, and this is the right way. And you say, no, you, you, all of you are wrong, but I see the truth. Just the height of deceit being deceived and blinded about ourselves. And at that point, we have to say, we can no longer carry out normal Christian fellowship with that person. They wouldn't be welcome to the Lord's table. When we talk about you can partake of the Lord's table if you've been a Christian, you've been professed that faith publicly, and you're in good standing with the local church, that's what we mean. And all the while, as we have reached out to this person, we continue to pray for them, even when they're put outside the church. We desire for reconciliation. We desire for a fresh encounter of the gospel in the life of that person. 
But these sobering words here of verse 17 work to protect the health of the church, yes. It seeks to protect the witness of the church, yes. But the purpose with reference to that individual person is to help them to see and to feel the gravity of their stubbornness, of their rebellion against Christ. So that they might be brought to repentance and turn away from their sin and embrace Christ. So Jesus' instruction here admittedly ends on a sober note. And remember, the entire process is designed to avoid that last step. That's why it's not just one time and the person's done. The only occasion that that happens is with someone who's divisive in the church. Paul tells Timothy to rebuke a divisive man once and the second time have nothing to do with them because of how dangerous that can be to a local church. But ordinarily, there are three steps there. And in these verses, Jesus is showing us what the gospel makes possible in our interactions, which will inevitably include some sinning against each other. And not just what the gospel makes possible, but now because of the changes God has brought about in my heart, and hopefully in your heart, we see the goodness in what Jesus instructs here. And we want to do what Jesus instructs us to do because we see the purpose and the goodness in it. And therefore, we want to obey what Jesus says to do. So if Jesus is saying to me, this is how I want you to interact with each other when you sin against each other, for yourself, for the sake of yourself, and for the sake of the church, then by Christ's empowering presence, this is what we want to do. The gospel makes it possible. Jesus calls us to it. Therefore, Grace Life Church, let's listen to Jesus and let us be obedient to His teaching. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this attractive instruction. That while the world is literally set on tearing apart people on the other side of issues, that your people, your church, can be a place where people literally, we, we really, Lord, we hurt one another. We sin against each other. It happens. And yet instead of that fracturing us, there's restoration. Father, thank you for this attractive life that you've called us to. That when people wrong us, we don't have to write them off. You've put within us a desire to pursue them. For the sake of the relationship, for the sake of the church, for the sake of that person, you call us to it. And Father, while there are the world would call and, and scoff at this process, while sadly even other professing Christians would try to dissuade us from being faithful to your word, Father, help us as a congregation to trust you over other voices in the world. Father, give us the strength and the power to be faithful to this very difficult process. Yet, Lord, when it works... When, when people committed to the gospel are, are, are on both sides, the beauty that comes from it. Let us celebrate that. Let us hope for that and pray towards that end. To see that when someone's wandering from the truth, that out of love we pursue them, we confront them, and we trust your gospel to bring them back. And Father, I pray that we would approach this task with great, with great trembling, with, with, with not a sort of a a dismissive attitude with arrogance in our heart, but with great humility, with the spirit of our Savior. May we pursue one another in watchfulness and care for one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.